Here it is. It's a positive command to visit the sick, comfort the mourners, carry the dead, accompany guests, gladden the bride. All these are gemilut chasadim and can be accomplished with your body, and there's no limit to them. And I love this. All the things that you, what, what is love? Uh, by the way, they're all fulfillments of love thy neighbor as thyself. What's love thy neighbor as thyself? He gives you the definition. Whatever you would want others to do for you, do for others. That's the mitzvah. Whatever you need, do it for other people. And then he continues. The reward for accompanying the guest on his journey is greater than all the other ways you can do love thy neighbor as thyself. All the other mitzvot rabbanan of gemilut chasadim, okay, they're good, but the, the most powerful one is the reward you get for accompanying, bringing in the stranger and accompanying them on his way. And he, then he quotes the Midrash, the law that our father Abraham, our father said, let them drink, and he accompanied them on their journey, and the Midrash says, greater is receiving guests than receiving the presence of the Shlina. As it says, and he looked up and he saw the three men, and he said, you know, oh Lord, don't leave. And then he says the following, excuse me, even more incredible, and accompanying them is even greater than welcoming them in. And all who do not accompany the stranger on his way is as if they spilled blood. What is the Rambam talking about? A, why is the mitzvah better than visiting the sick, better than dowering the bride? But why is welcoming in the stranger the best? And the second question is, why is walking with the stranger on the way even better? And if you don't do it, you're spilling <clears throat> blood. Any thoughts? I mean, so they're more vulnerable. Yeah. Well, but sick people are also terribly vulnerable. All kinds of people are vulnerable. You think they're more vulnerable. Okay. I said, and my husband actually always walks people out, and I started doing that too. I just think it makes them feel like maybe you're not kicking them out, you're mm -hmm. walking out with them. And then one time he came back and found somebody's kid sitting outside our door because my friend stopped off for a minute and forgot her kid. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's the feeling of completing, completing the, the visit. So two things I want to suggest here. I think the Rambam is saying to us, the Midrash highlights this because this is Avram and Sarah's test that made them Avram and Sarah. Like, if you want to know what the fundamental chesed is that is the, the core of covenantal Jewish identity, it is this, welcoming in the stranger. And had they failed in this, they would not have been Abram and Sarah. In other words, it, the reason I think he loves it is because it is, it's arc, it's, you know, kind of core for the, for the message of, of covenantal identity. And then, now, why walking on the way? So, maybe you can get it from backwards. Why is it like spilling blood if you don't? So, my assumption is, is that the world that Avram may have lived in is not such a safe space. And so, you accompany people on the outside because it's one thing to welcome in the threatened other. But what if you then let the threatened other walk out the door and don't do anything about the public space? Shame on you. That's like spilling blood. And so what do you do? What does walking with the person do? You're sort of maintaining the covenant. You what? You're sort of maintaining the covenant. How? What does walking with the person in the public space do? You're giving them chizuk and protecting them. So you are somehow... Cutting down their exposure. You are standing what next to them. Have, have, you, have ever you heard about a GSA? Maybe some of you in the room have. A Gay-Straight Alliance in public schools all across America. They are terribly important for the psychological health of gay and lesbian kids in schools because it's one thing to have a little room where you can gather together and share your truth. It's another to walk out in the halls of the high school and know that an ally, they're, they're not gay alliances, meaning in the sense of gay people go to, go to a room and talk about their experience. No, it is about gay straight alliance because 
the thing that will change the, the life of that kid more than anything else is to have a straight ally in the halls getting his back, making sure no one, like in other words, you understand, it's, it's communicating to the larger public space, I am here, I have this person, you can't, you have no, like, you know, you got to get through me before you get to this person, right? So I think the Rambam is actually articulating that here. Yeah? You're also, you're, you're exposing yourself to risk, and in so doing, making yourself that person's experience. You, so you begin, don't just advocate from that friend, you advocate from your totally. own Totally. Well. You begin to fully get what it means for them to walk in public. You get it. I think the single most important thing for Orthodox rabbis to do is to is walk in somebody else's shoes, including gay and lesbian shoes. What would it mean? I once did a, 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 a gathering of conservative rabbis, and I had them all go around the room and introduce themselves and end with, and I am gay. You couldn't imagine how difficult that was, mm -hmm. because just the statement itself was terrifying for them to, even though everyone knew that they were, I, I'd asked them to say it, right? Because somehow identifying fully, existentially with the crisis someone else is feeling, it just, it, it's challenging and it's difficult. Now, I want to finish this series by saying that um, the welcoming of strangers is really hard work then, because it means being willing to open our doors to difference, and it's not always fun, easy. Um, and the complications can get difficult to manage. Klimo used to say, another Midrash, every day, an arrow in the eye of Satan. One day it was the eve of the Day of Atonement, and Satan disguised himself as a poor man and he came to the door of Plimo. Now Plimo's a wealthy guy, he gives to the poor, and he feels like, the Satan on Erebium Kippur has nothing on me. The Satan does not like hearing that, so I would discourage you from saying it. The Satan shows up as a poor man. So what happens is the poor man asks for bread at the door. On such a day as this when everyone's inside, says the poor man, shall I be outside? Plimo was ready to give him some food out in the door, but he says, no, but on such a day like this, shouldn't I be inside? And so he was taken inside the house, probably put in the kitchen, and bread was given him. On a day like this, says the poor man, when everyone sits at the table, should I sit alone? So he brings him into the table, into the dining room, where his lovely guests are eating dinner before him to board. As he was led to the table, he sat down, and it was clear that his body was covered with sores, and they were oozing. And he sat down and began to behave repulsively at the table. Plimo rebuked him. Sit properly, he said. The poor man turned to Plimo and said, rudely, give me a glass of liquor. One was given him. He coughed and spat phlegm into it. I like teaching this <laughs> text to adolescent boys. It's <laughs> <laughs> They scolded him, and thereupon he had a heart attack and died. And Plimo's household hears Christ in the street. Plimo's killed a man. Plimo's killed a man. Plimo, terrified, goes to hide in the public latrine. You know, this is a Palestinian text, text from the period of the, you know, the Gemara when Jews are living in places where there are Roman, Roman <coughs> bathrooms all outside, public bathrooms all outside. <laughs> and that's where he goes. <coughs> Seeing how Cleo was suffering, the Satan disclosed his identity and said to him, never speak in this way, an arrow in the eye of Satan. This text is about how we really want difference at the door. We want to deal with it at the door. Okay, maybe in the kitchen, at our dining room table, oozing sores, people who behave poorly. The challenge of welcome is enormous. It means that our lovely, beautiful dinner parties need to be prepared for the chaos of difference. Somebody may come in. It's, you know, by the way, in my family, <laughs> my aunt, I go to my aunt Sayers, and there's this lovely lady who is really a pain to deal with at the Seder, and it kind of like it's so disruptive, and she's just a hard to deal with person. And my aunt says, Yeah, Steve, she has nowhere to go. Mm. So, mm. 
So we suffer, so we do. Like the family actually recognizes, we'll have to figure out how to manage a Seder with a disruptive person. Because that's the job. In other words, Avram, none of us should feel that having the exclusive community of our friends and family and community, there's nothing wrong with that until someone is at the door and needs help and needs us. And then there simply is no other question to ask except how do we help you in? And that frame here has to be recognized as extremely